All right, this is the final lecture uh, in this uh, Cognitive Neuroscience of uh, Human Memory section. Um, we talked in the last lecture about um, neuroimaging and uh, memory, and now we want to talk about very sort of at a general level um, the underlying sort of specific neurobiological processes involved what we call memory consolidation. Um, we're not going to dive down into the NMDA receptor and a lot of the other things that are involved in this process, but I'm going to give you a sort of a general overview of how uh, consolidation works and some of the evidence for consolidation. So let's start with a look at what we're going to talk about today. We'll start with consolidation in the hippocampus, and specifically I want to look at some evidence from brain injuries and we'll kind of revisit some things we discussed uh, in some earlier lectures sort of bring it home here to this idea of consolidation. Then we'll talk about sleep and memory consolidation, stress and memory consolidation, and then finally we're going to kind of skip through the sort of three major areas of uh, the cellular basis of memory. Long-term potentiation, talk about standard consolidation theory, and then what we call multiple trace theory. Um, but let's get into consolidation in the hippocampus. So consolidation is the process by which memories are strengthened to allow for long-term retention. We really believe this is occurring by increasing connections between neurons, um, generating new neurons, um, which there, evidence on that is early in terms of the exact part of that process. Uh, but essentially this is how memories um, are created and strengthened uh, through connections between neurons. And this is all based essentially on what we call Hebb's Law or Hebbian Learning. Um, and if you'll remember, Donald Hebb is the um, creator of this idea of connections between neurons. Lots of work been done in this area. And we certainly know this is the process by which uh, memories are formed. Um, underlying all of that are, are lots of questions. Uh, there appear to be some um, epigenetic alterations in the cells themselves uh, that we'll be learning about. There are biochemical processes involved. Uh, but we certainly know that your experiences take some time to be permanently stored. And that temporal nature of amnesia provides us with a lot of evidence for this phenomenon. So a couple lectures back, we took a look at um, what we call shrinking retrograde amnesia. And this particular patient had a severe head injury, was in a coma for seven weeks, um, and was followed for uh, quite a period of time. And what you can see is um, in their sort of first examination, um, they have... Um, anterior grade amnesia from the um, incident to that first examination, um, about three months, uh, is where they've really lost all of their memory following the injury. Uh, in their first examination, sort of gross disturbance of memory back to infancy, complete and total blank of the previous two years. The next examination, we start to see recovery. And what happens is in a head, a little, a little, a head injury is it disrupts a lot of the processes involved in the brain while it's busy trying to um, heal and repair itself. There's a lot of inflammation, so these processes can't um, resolve. So now as the person's healing, we start to see improvements in their um, retrograde amnesia, still complete and total anterior grade amnesia of about three months. We get a couple of memories, recent memories uh, as they heal. Um, then finally, uh, in their last examination we see here in uh, area C, memory's normal for everything up until about two weeks prior to their injury. Um, obviously, they don't remember anything during their coma. We wouldn't expect them to, but about three and a half months of total anterior grade amnesia. After that, their memory is perfectly fine. So at this point, their brain is healed, uh, and they are able to uh, function normally. So what this tells us is those memories that were... Um, for experiences two weeks prior to the injury, those had not been consolidated. Um, and so that traumatic injury disrupted that process of, of consolidation and they're lost forever. We also see while the brain is recovering, we get anterior grade amnesia for that entire period as well because the, none of those memories are consolidated or stored either because that process has been completely disrupted. And so, um, this gives us uh, some evidence for the sort of temporal nature of anterior grade amnesia. And we see something similar with uh, electroconvulsive therapy amnesia. And this provides us with really uh, a pretty pr precise model of this idea of temporally graded amnesia. And so ECT is, of course, a procedure in which uh, grand mal seizure is induced by um, providing 
an electric shock to the brain. It's done under sedation. It's far safer than it was, say, um, if you're picturing one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Um, it's not that uh, type of seizure anymore. But um, we still get a little bit of amnesia surrounding that electroconvulsive therapy, and it's a little bit different for everyone. But again, we have this injury that occurs, um, and uh, patients can lose up to six months prior and two months following um, ECT-induced amnesia. So those um, memories prior to the um, ECT treatment had not been consolidated yet, and those ones following do not get consolidated due to that uh, disruption in neuronal um, functioning. So essentially this provides us with some evidence about the timeline of uh, memories going from being experienced to being permanently stored or consolidated. So one of the things we know is that sleep is important for this process. While you're sleeping, your brain is consolidating your memories. Lots of evidence for this. Um, one of the most important things to understand about sleep is you should um, be sleeping, first of all. Um, normal sleep is very important for memory consolidation. Um, so, and this is immediate. That is, if you study, you know, Thursday evening and then um, go to sleep, you'll remember things better Friday morning. If you stay up all night Friday, um, you're not going to remember those things from Thursday very well, all those things you studied. And so uh, that's an important part of understanding. All-nighters are a terrible idea because sleep is so important. Uh, dreaming appears to be directly related to offline memory consolidation, and so there's a great uh, sort of review paper, Roy Walmsley, from 2014. Uh, what we think is happening in uh, dreams is, so sleep is an altered state of consciousness. You're not unconscious, you're just not fully conscious, <laughs> um, which is different. And so one of the things that's happening while you are sleeping is those experiences are, um, those memory traces are being activated uh, in order to consolidate them into permanent memories. And your consciousness is catching bits and pieces of that, which is why there's familiar elements that are put together in weird ways. And so while your consciousness is trying to make sense of all of that, it includes bits and pieces from your life. So, for example, you might know that you're at your childhood home, but the home that you're in doesn't look anything like your childhood home. Um, but then recent experiences will be occurring there. So these are the sort of things that happen. And oftentimes we kind of get recurring themes, things that you might uh, generally be anxious about oftentimes can uh, appear in that as well. I'm always in airports for whatever reason. I can never find my flight. Um, a couple other things about sleep. Uh, more recent evidence shows that during deep sleep, cerebral spinal fluid is washing over the brain. That is, you could actually see waves of cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and we believe what that's doing is it's helping to clear out um, some of the detritus uh, from your neurons functioning. Neurons actually burn through a lot of um, sugar and oxygen, and there are waste products that have to be removed from the brain, um, sort of leftover proteins from breaking down of... Uh, neurotransmitters, that sort of thing. And uh, so that deep sleep um, sort of helps sort of clear out all that detritus. And lack of sleep may be related to, to dementia risk, particularly lack of that kind of deep sleep. And so sleep aids, alcohol, both of those can disrupt that kind of deep level of sleep. And so that's part of the reason why they might be associated with risk for dementia. Along with that are things like sleep apnea, uh, where you don't get into that deep sleep, and it's also associated with risk for dementia. Um, there's also some really interesting evidence that sleeping on a difficult problem uh, might help you get to the solution. In my cognition class, uh, in my problem-solving lecture, I talk about um, this sort of belief that you can be working on a, prob a problem unconsciously. Um, and uh, there is evidence that if you sleep on a problem, you actually will um, do better. So take a look at that um, on my YouTube channel. You can find that under problem solving. Finally, um, in terms of just some things that affect consolidation before we get into some other issues, um, we know that uh, cortisol uh, from stress has been shown to reduce hippocampal volume and is a risk factor for depression and actually results in reduced memory. Uh, lots of research been done in this area, uh, both animal and human models. So if you see people with elevated cortisol levels, um, they do have reduced hippocampal volume of about 14% for major depressive disorder. But also if you look at things like Cushing's disease, which is an elevated cortisol condition, uh, you see that as well. 
Uh, the CA1 uh, subfield pyramidal cells are particularly sensitive to cortisol levels, and we see um, memory reductions due to reductions in this particular area. That may be related to some reductions in neurogenesis, but also in the reduction in these neurons themselves. We also see um, reductions in dendritic branching in some areas. Um, again, I have uh, some pretty uh, thorough lectures about depression in my Drugs and Human Behavior course, and so take a look at that. Look at the 2018 um, YouTube lectures in that area. Um, finally, diet and exercise and some antidepressants can mitigate that loss of uh, CA1 subfield neurons uh, by increasing brain-derived neurotrophin factor. Um, and so the Mediterranean diet, um, fish oils, um, healthy nuts, healthy fats, uh, reductions in carbohydrates, sugars, fats, uh, unhealthy fats. The so-called Western diet uh, is particularly bad. Uh, exercise certainly it doesn't have to be you don't have to go running um, you increasing walking uh, getting out amongst even um, uh, natural areas can increase brain drive neurotrophin factor or uh, weight training whatever kind of exercise you want to do uh, can be associated with that also some antidepressants um, reduce cortisol release and also um, the diet and exercise both can really reduce cortisol release but can also help mitigate the loss of CA1 neurons and can actually help um, fix them. And in fact, that's what we think most antidepressants are doing is actually fixing the neuronal damage caused by stress. Uh, in particular, there's some really interesting data on ketamine. Uh, there's a fascinating study in science that came out a couple of years ago um, that I highly recommend taking a look at. Okay, that gets us then to... Um, long-term potentiation, standard consolidation, and multiple trace theory. So long-term potentiation is a specific neurochemical process by which uh, we get long-term excitatory postsynaptic potentials. That is, um, the, the connections between neurons are strengthened because of an increased likelihood of an action potential. Um, so that's why it's called long-term potentiation. So it's this enduring facilitation of transmission. Uh, this can be disrupted by uh, traumatic injury to the brain, but can also be disrupted by some drugs. So in my research career, uh, I've been involved in uh, drug-induced amnesia studies. So benzodiazepine sedatives, which are, which are used to treat anxiety. Uh, these include things like... Um, oh, uh, Ativan, Valium, um, and Midazolam. We use the drug Midazolam. And those drugs... Um, are what we call GABA agonists. So GABA is gamma aminobutyric acid, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And those drugs um, reduce long-term potentiation in the hippocampus, uh, and as a result, can reduce memory formation. And so in our studies, we we're actually able to demonstrate very dense anterograde amnesia caused by those drugs by disrupting long-term potentiation. So providing evidence for this uh, as being part of the cellular process involved in uh, creating long-term memories. That is then combined into these other two theories. Uh, standard consolidation theory uh, talks about how these memory traces are created and where they're created. Um, so according to standard consolida consolidation theory, the neocortex is crucial for storage of fully consolidated memories. And anything that's fully consolidated uh, does not require use of the hippocampus. I don't like this theory and I don't buy this theory. Uh, and in particular, if you look at the results I talked about in the previous lecture, showing that the hippocampus is involved in uh, recollection uh, responses or retrieval, accurate retrieval of the context of memories. Um, I think that the standard consolidation doesn't hold out. But multiple trace theory, which is the theory that I am particularly fond of, holds that only semantic memories are entirely in the neocortex. Um, so some of the research I've been involved with shows that early semantic memories involve the hippocampus and contextual memory, but eventually they become independent of context and hippocampus. And multiple trace theory holds that episodic memory continually relies on the hippocampus and that new traces, that new memory traces, are created with each retrieval of a memory. And this is consistent with so much data that we have. So, for example, there's what we call the testing effect. And the testing effect uh, shows that if you retrieve a memory, you strengthen a memory. We call it retrieval-induced learning. And so when you try to retrieve something rather than studying it, um, but actually try to retrieve it, you're far more likely to remember it later. So uh, basic paradigm in these is you can actually study items. Let's say you study an item, 
then you study an item, then you get tested, or you study an item, get tested, and they get tested again. And that testing has been shown to improve memory significantly over the long term compared to just simply restudying the material. So testing yourself is actually a very important um, strategy for um, learning, and it's very consistent with this multiple trace theory that I've been talking about because it helps lay down uh, that foundation uh, that is the um, reopening a memory trace um, is created with each retrieval. This is also consistent with some of the um, evidence we've talked about previously in which um, we can actually reduce the, tra the trauma or stress associated with memories by uh, blocking the reconsolidation of um, epinephrine or norepinephrine with a memory. So essentially this is reconsolidation theory, not consolidation theory. So each time you remember something, it's reconsolidated. That's the reason it's called multiple trace theory. Okay, so that is uh, the end of our discussions of the neurobiology of memory. The next set of lectures, we're going to get into emotional memory. So transition very nicely from this particular material. Um, so there'll be a lecture or two on emotions, then we'll get into uh, language, and then finally we'll finish up with cognitive control uh, and some relatively quick uh, and short lectures. Thank you.